This is the Project 533 Tiny Trainer. It's a three inch racing drone designed by Evan Turner, heads up FPV, one of the fastest racing pilots in the world to help him practice for his DRL seasons. And my first question was, why is this damn thing so popular? Sorry for swearing right there at the beginning of the video, parents. Why is this thing so popular? And how could a three inch quad help somebody train to fly a big, heavy seven inch quad? But the fact is, the Tiny Trainer has gotten super, super popular. There's even a spec racing league where people just race only these so everybody is on an even footing. And that means it's finally time for me, in partnership with FPV Crate, who graciously sent me this build kit, link in the video description, to find out what's so freaking special about the Project 533 Tiny Trainer. I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're gonna learn something today. So let's go over the parts that are gonna go into this build, and it's really cool that FPV Crate is just sending you all the parts as opposed to like you having to sort them out individually. Well, you get some stickers. Everybody loves stickers, don't they? Oh, and a awesome wiring diagram. Fantastic. Cute. Oh, and the stickers even, there are even stickers for your tiny trainer. That's really nice. Okay, we've got some heads up FPV uh, T3 by 1.8 props. Great. The TBS Unify Pro 32 Nano. That is one of the smallest, best video transmitters you can get for these small quads. Again, there are a lot of small ones, but they are usually pretty crappy. Um, the Lumineer Axi Micro Antenna. The Cadex FPV Kangaroo Camera. Here are the pieces of the Tiny Trainer itself. This is the frame. Some 533 motors. Ooh. Cute. And this is the flight controller and ESC. This is an all-in-one, truly all-in-one flight controller and ESC in one board. Beta FPV has several of these for quadcopters at any different sort of size and weight and output. This will be the first build that I've done with one of them. Oh, right. What about the receiver? You might think that I'm gonna put Crossfire in this and that would be a fine choice, but I'm gonna actually try something different. This is the Immersion RC Ghost receiver. I got two of these receivers in my reviewer's kit and I'm gonna put Ghost in it because Ghost is supposed to be like super good for racing, right? And the Multi-GB qualifier is this weekend. So I'm gonna take this guy to the Multi-GB qualifier and see if I can race it in the qualifier and race it on Immersion RC Ghost. I'm gonna start by installing the motors. Um, I like to install, work sort of outside in on my quads. Motors come with screws and I do hope they're the correct length for this frame since this is presumably the frame that they're designed to be used with. So we've got several different lengths of screws, some longer ones here and some shorter ones. And I'm gonna guess that the shorter one is the, yeah, that's plenty long enough. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tape down the wires. Um, it's not as necessary, I think, to protect the wires on this build, since this build has uh, the cowling, the plastic cover to protect them, but it's always a good idea to keep things you know, in place. I'm just gonna lay them flat on the arm and get off of there. I'm gonna lay them flat on the arm and tape them down. That'll just help keep them in place while I'm working and soldering and so forth. Next, we're gonna install this 3D printed piece, which is the battery holder. And what I want you to do is I want you to line it up. Ah, see, I've got it backwards. See this little U-shaped piece right here that sticks out? That's gonna go on this screw hole right here. And you can see that there's only one way to make that work. If you try and do it the other way, it hangs off the end. So that's gonna get lined up there. And I think that the easiest way to do this is gonna be like so. I'm gonna get these short screws from the kit of parts. There's a long set of M2 and a short set of M2 screws. I'm gonna get the short set. Now, a lot of times when I put screws through TPU, I like to use a washer because the screw head can just pull through. Um, I don't have any M2 washers that will work in this application. And if you were to put a washer on here, then you might need a little bit of a longer screw because the washer is gonna have some thickness. 
So I'm just going to install this as they should, you know, as they intended, but I might like to use washers if I was to do it my way. So I'm going to install the screws. I'm just going to put the screws through the plastic. <laughs> Great. I stabbed my finger. And then I'm going to take the long screws and this is going to go through the hole in the little U-shaped piece. And it's going to go through this hole in the frame. And then one of these plastic M2 nuts is going to go down over it. Next, I'm going to take the remaining long screws, and they are going to go... It'll make more sense when we look at it from the other side, but they're going to go into a screw hole right here. And what we're doing is we're building up the four um, flight control stack screws. So one is going to go up through there, and then one is going to go through the rear. And when we're done doing that, we will have four M2 screws sticking up in a diamond pattern for our flight controller. Next we'll take the flight controller and we have to install these little rubber gummies in here. This is a pain in the butt. Everybody's got their own sort of way of doing it. Um, I just jam them in. Some people take dental floss, pass the, make a U of dental floss, pass it through the hole, and then stick this in the U and use it to kind of pull it, pull it through. Uh, just whatever works for you. I'm just going to stick them through. Hmm. Now, I believe that this is the front. So this is going to go onto these screws. Oh, I have it upside down. It goes on, yes. Here's the front facing arrow. It goes on with the leads facing down. Thankfully, they are pre-soldered. That's very nice. And we'll just carefully push that down. Make sure you don't jam the gummies out by accident. By pushing down too aggressively, just work it down slowly. Once you've got that installed, there are four more. Can you see it? <laughs> Holding it up like you can see it. There's four more of the M2 nuts, the little plastic nuts, and we'll go ahead and install them on top. When you're tightening down nuts on top of a flight controller gummy, uh, it's important not to crush it too much. If you tighten it too tight, the gummy can't do its job of vibration isolation. Obviously, if you do it too loosely, well, with M3 hardware, if you do it too loosely, the nut can come off, but these M2 nylon nuts seem to have a lot of friction, and it really doesn't seem like they're going to back off, so I guess that's a good thing. Just tighten them down enough that they are snug, but don't over-tighten them and crush the gummies. Next, we're going to trim and solder the motor wires, and the motor outputs on this are here, 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 and here. Um, it does come with some plugs if you wanted to solder on the plugs and then get plug-on motors. I don't recommend that. If you're buying a pre-build like an Emacs Tiny Hawk and it's got plug motors, well, that's fine, especially if you're a beginner and you just really don't want to solder. But those plugs, they have more loss, especially as they get older. People will find that their quadcopter gets less powerful or maybe even starts falling out of the air. Uh, and the, a lot of people have fixed this by removing the plugs and direct soldering their motors and suddenly their quad comes back to life again. So we're going to direct solder and it's going to be, it's going to be fine. So I'm going to measure this to length and I'm going to cut it, but always give yourself a little bit of extra wire and a little bit of slack. If you cut it exactly to length and then it turns out to be too short, you're going to be screwed. So I'm going to come maybe hmm, almost maybe even as much as like a centimeter past the pad. And yeah, we'll have some slack sitting in there, but number one, it's gonna be under the canopy, so it's not like we're even gonna see it. And trust me, I've been there before. Now this is silicon insulation, which means it is soft, flexible, and it is easy to strip with your fingernails. So that's what I'm gonna do. If you have a fancy wire stripper, you go right ahead and use it, but I think fingernails are just fine. And I'm stripping off about, I'd say three to four millimeters of insulation. And I'm gonna fire up a soldering iron at a temperature of, let's say, 750 Fahrenheit. I'm gonna twist, 
the wires so there's no spare strands. Now a really common mistake that people make when they go to tin their wires is that they get a blob of solder or a little spatter of solder on their flight controller. Since we don't have a lot of room to spare here, I'm just going to take this cardboard box that came with the motors and I'm just going to set it over the flight controller to help keep myself from, oh, fooey. Okay. Yeah, that'll be fine. And then I'm going to tin the wires with fresh solder and cut them to length. When you cut the wires to length, you want them to be about the same length or a tiny bit shorter as the pad that they're going to solder to. So they don't stick out on either direction. Um, usually on the stuff we're working with, a length of about two millimeters, maybe a little less, is good. Next, we're going to tin all uh, 16 of the 12 of the motor pads. There's 16 screws and 12 pads. We're going to tin all 12 of these pads. Oh, now, I think it's pretty likely that you're going to encounter a solder blob just like I did because these pads are pretty close together. If that happens, just take a dry iron with no solder on it and just swipe in between them like that and you'll clean off the extra. I've done it again. There we go. And the solder isn't wanting to stick very much. It might mean that my iron is a little cold. It might mean that I could use some uh, flux. Where's my flux pen? Solder flows towards heat. So if the solder is not sticking to the pad, one possible cause is that the pad is not hot. There we go. There are others, but that's one possible. So if I remove the iron too soon, the solder just comes right with the iron. It doesn't stick to the pad because the pad hasn't gotten the chance to get hot yet. This right here is liquid electrical flux. It is uh, comes in a pen. That's just like a marker pen that you put on there, and it makes your soldering work better. Um, this is a kind of flux called no clean flux. Flux is normally uh, it's normally required that you clean after it with like alcohol to clean it off and. I've always used no clean flux because I am lazy and I don't like to clean up after myself. Um, I discovered a potential advantage of no clean flux uh, recently when I hung out with some folks who were using regular non no clean flux and that stuff was like, it would like short circuit and stuff and burn off. And I've never experienced that. I've always heard that flux can be conductive, and if you don't clean the flux, you can short and spark and maybe damage stuff. Uh, like in one case, an ESC fried, and the best I could tell was that there was a big glob of flux on the bottom of the ESC, and it let it arc to the carbon fiber frame and ruined it. Um, I don't know if they were just going super heavy on their flux, or if this no clean flux that I use doesn't have that problem, but I've never experienced that. And, I think I'm going to stick to what I'm using, what's working for me. Now, one of the most common mistakes that people are going to make when they try to solder up a motor like this is that they're going to bridge these pads uh, with solder. And it's hard to tell whether you've done that because the motor wires are actually connected inside the motor. So if you try to measure for continuity between these two pads, you'll get, yes, there's continuity. There's continuity not between the two pads, but actually literally up through the motor and back out again. And until until I watched Paul build his 533, I didn't have a great way to tell, other than visual inspection, whether that was happening. Here's what you can do. Take the motor and spin it. And you see how it keeps spinning briefly? Now watch this. If I take this tool and I'm gonna short circuit two of these pads as if there was a solder blob and watch what happens. You see that it's stopping on its own? Now I'm going to remove the tool. Yeah. So what's going on there is a thing called FET drag. When And the, the takeaway is that when these two are short-circuited, there's actually a braking effect on the motor. If you short-circuit them, then when you go to spin it, it will not keep spinning, but it'll stop rather abruptly, and that's your sign that there is a short circuit there. Next, we're going to take these standoffs, and we're going to install the two rear standoffs. We'll go back to these screws uh, that were just pressed through the TPU, and you were probably wondering when I was going to get back to them. We're just going to squeeze that screw through the base plate and install the standoff. Get in there! 
I might like these screws to be a little longer. But uh, I'm sure that they know what they're doing. You gotta be careful in a situation like this. If you screw the screw down too tight, it will just rip through. Um, so you gotta just find that happy medium where it's tight enough, but it's not gonna back out. But it's not so tight that it's gonna rip through. Now, a lot of you guys are not, I, I dare say, basically nobody is going to be using the Immersion RC Ghost Receiver because at this time it's not available to the public yet. Maybe going forward more of you will. But the gist is that you're going to solder up power, ground, and signal. And I'll show you, like, for various types of receiver where you would put those things. The Ghost Receiver has a ground pad, a 5 volt pad, or plus, marked as plus, and an S for signal pad. The receiver pads on this Beta FPV flight controller are right here, uh, straight across from the USB port, and I can't even read them from up here, but there's a 5 volt and a ground, or vice versa, and then there's one marked RC-S, that one is for S bus if you're using a FreeSky receiver, um, and then there are T1 and R1, and that's what you're going to use for any other type of receiver. For a crossfire receiver, you would use the T1 and R1. Uh, from the IO1 and IO2 pins of the Crossfire receiver. For a Spectrum receiver, you would use R1 if it is a DSM receiver, or you would use T1 if it's an SRXL or SRXL2 receiver. And that is actually what we're going to be doing with the Ghost receiver. Now on the tiny trainer, the receiver is going to go back here. And so I will just uh, run these wires over to where they're going to go. Give myself just a little bit of extra and let's solder them down. I feel obligated to tell you this is not the stock antenna on the Ghost receiver. Ghost actually comes with a special antenna that's better than this, but I I can't find I can't find it. I put it somewhere and I can't find it. So I'm just going with a regular 2.4 gig antenna that I pulled off a old Spectrum receiver that's sitting around. I'm not joking. Uh, I'm going to wrap this in Kapton tape. I like to use Kapton tape instead of heat shrink. I just find it's easier to apply and I don't know. It's always the right size. It's never the wrong size. Uh, and I guess I'm going to need to... Yeah. Hmm. I always fold the UFL connector back over the receiver as opposed to having it straight out because this way it can get ripped off. Um, but this is going to need to go like so, and then the antenna is going to come out the back of the quad. So let's see how is the best way to do this. Yeah, I feel good about that. I don't feel great about it, but I feel okay about it. Now that's going to sit on top of these wires. This 3D printed piece is to hold the video transmitter and it's going to go on the rear standoffs like so. Let's move these wires over to the other side so they don't interfere with the USB connector. There we go. I guess I should probably bind... I'm going to get out the bind button. I should probably bind this thing before I do that. So we'll just power this up for the first time, and then in the module, we will go to bind. And I'm going to choose my protocol, which I want to be SRXL2 because it's the fastest one. I'm going to set channel 12 to output LQ. You can also have a different channel output RSSI, but since Betaflate only supports one RSSI channel, we kind of can have one or the other, and LQ is the more useful one to have. Presumably, in a future version of Betaflight, Betaflight will read LQ and RSSI directly from the ghost telemetry, the same way it does for Crossfire, but that doesn't work today. All right, and then we will start bind. Oh, wow, that was really freaking fast. And we're done. Now that the receiver is bound, let's go ahead and put this VTX shelf in the quad. Next, the video transmitter. The video transmitter that FPV Crate includes is the Unify Pro 32 Nano. It's pretty nice that they've included this one because it comes with a button pre-installed. You don't have to solder a button on it like you do that other Unify Nano. I guess that's the Unify Nano Pro, not the Pro 32. Let's go ahead and solder the wires onto this one. And uh, 
then we'll solder it up to the flight controller. Now these wires that come with the Unify are pre-tinned, but I always add fresh solder to pre-tinned wires. And the reason for that is that the the tin the fa the solder that they use at the factory is lead free because all commercial app, you know manufacturers have to use lead free solder for regulatory reasons, and that means it flows like crap. And the other reason is that this solder has flux in it, which will help uh, the joint flow. Of course, we're going to add a little flux with our flux pen too, but just always, never, never rely on factory solder. Get the flux pen, we'll add a little flux here, just, and away we go. What I think I'm going to do is fold these guys back over the VTX so that they get wrapped up in the heat shrink and that'll help give them a little bit more reinforcement so they don't, I don't know, just seems like a good idea to me. Now the wiring diagram shows this video transmitter getting VBAT, which surprises the heck out of me. Most small video transmitters like this take five volts, but presumably they know what they're talking about. And I am pretty impressed that somebody got a VBAT. I guess it's only 3S, I think, but still pretty impressed that somebody's got VBAT going into a video transmitter this freaking small. The pads we're gonna use are ground, and it looks like it says plus VB, which are these two pads right here. Check your wiring diagram. I'm not sure that you'll be able to see on my camera exactly which pads I'm soldering to. And then over here we have two pads labeled out and T2 and those are going to be for the video and the smart audio. For the camera we're going to take this 3D printed piece and of course our camera and I believe this way is up. Yeah because the camera has to look up so we're going to turn the camera right side up. The wire is coming out of the top. And we're just going to insert that in. Perfect. And then we're going to uh, make the camera's mounting holes line up with these screw holes. And the camera should come with some screws that we can use to mount it. Now it's got a lot of different ones, several different lengths, some of them super long. Make sure you try to use the shortest one that seems to get the job done because if it's too long and goes in too far it can damage the camera. This kangaroo camera comes with a separate three wire plug that plugs into the back of the camera and makes it easier to remove the camera for maintenance if you ever need to. So we're going to go ahead and solder that on to the flight controller. And that's going to go to the three pads just over here to the side of where you soldered the video transmitter. And I think this is a good time to put the front standoffs on. I think we're done soldering to the front of the flight controller, so these standoffs won't be getting in our way. Unfortunately, the receiver wire is a little bit in the way here, but we're going to do what we can. Now I don't think we got an LED kit with this. Yeah, some of the um, 533 kits, we don't have LEDs. Okay, no big deal. Well, what if we remove the standoffs and install them first and kind of slide in from behind? Yeah. So I'm just going to take the whole thing out, press the standoffs into place here, and then try to kind of slide in here underneath. Yeah, that's that's going to do it. So you just got to kind of slide it in underneath the flight controller, and then come and get the screws from this side. OK. 
could have shortened this one. I could have shortened this camera one up uh, quite a bit, but that's okay. And this is going to be for the little joystick, which we can use to configure the camera, or if it's especially if it shipped it with an on-screen display that we don't want. We'll just take this green and black wire that came with the camera. We'll plug it into this joystick board, and we'll hang on to that for later after we power up. In fact, I think we're done. Well, we're not. We're not done. Done. We got to still put the top on it and stuff, but uh, and figure out. What this piece is for. Oh, what's this piece for? Well, okay, we've pretty much finished building this guy. All the electronics are in piece and all this in place, and all the soldering is done. Now we got to go over to the computer and we got to like just check it out and see if everything's working. So let's do it. Now you and I both know that I already plugged a battery in to this quad, but technically I should have done that using this little device in order to protect myself from any dumb mistakes. The chances of dumb mistakes are a little lower because this is an all-in-one, so there's no wiring between the flight controller and the ESC to screw up. And that is a very common place that people screw up. If you wanna know more about what this freaking thing is, there's a link in the video description. This is a V-Fly short saver, and it will save your butt. Let's do an official smoke check. Um, I wanna just plug in my battery to the short saver and I'm gonna plug in here and hopefully everything will power up as it should. No smoke. Great. Yep, I got a, a beeping light on the video transmitter and the ghost receiver of course is all lit up and everything seems to be okay. And let's just grab my goggles here and see if I can find like what channel is it on? It's probably on, uh, probably on. Yeah, there we go. Uh, okay, yeah. Using the joystick that came with the camera, I'm gonna plug in to the green and white wire that is coming out of the camera, and then I'm gonna press up for two seconds on the joystick to get to the secret menu that lets you turn the on-screen display off. This would be great. If pilot off, timer off, white screen no, TV mode NTSC, that's all fine. This would be great if we didn't have a flight controller with a great OSD, but we do. And so, so the first thing I'm going to do is flash this flight controller to Betaflight 4.2. There is a ProTune out there for it, but the ProTune is tuned for Betaflight 4.2. Um, and before you flash your flight controller, it is always a good idea to connect and to take a look here in the upper left to get the target name correct. And the target name here is Beta FPV F411. We'll go to the firmware flasher. And we will find Beta FPV F411. There it is. And we'll choose the latest version of Betaflight 4.2. And then we'll hit load firmware and flash firmware. First time you connect to Betaflight 4.2, it'll ask you if you want to apply custom defaults. We'll just say yes to that. Should always say yes to that. The accelerometer is enabled, but it is not calibrated. Well, okay, I'm gonna just lay the quad flat on the desk. I'm gonna have to use my fingers to do that because it's got the battery thing on the bottom, but we'll just calibrate the accelerometer, good and we will proceed with our configuration. Now, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna spin the motors and confirm that the motors are going the right direction. So before I can do that though, I'm gonna need to go to configuration and let's get this set up. This is an F4 processor. On Betaflight 4.2, it's recommended to use DSHOT 300. Over here on the left, we're gonna choose motor direction is reversed. Most racers prefer to fly with what's called props out rotation. So we're gonna set this up with props out rotation as well. You can see as I do that, it changes whether the props are spinning in towards the center line or out. And we're gonna do motor direction is reversed for props out. We want 4K PID loop frequency. Again, that's what's recommended for an F4. I'm gonna put in my call sign. We'll go to the motors tab 
and I understand the risks. The props are removed because we haven't put our props on yet. I'm going to spin the motors one at a time, and I'm going to make a note that the correct motor position spins. So with the quad facing away from me, number one will be the back right, and so on, as shown in this diagram. And I'm going to make a note of which direction the motor spins and whether it's spinning the direction shown in the diagram. Motor number one. Correct direction. Okay, so I need to reverse the direction of motors two and three. The next thing we need to do is go in and reverse the motor direction in the BL Heli configurator. This is a BL Heli SESC, so we're going to download this BL Heli configurator app. Um, link in the video description and I've got a folder on my computer called RC Utilities where I put these things. In fact, here's an older version of BLA Configurator which I'm just going to get rid of and I'm going to take this file that I downloaded and just drag everything over onto my hard drive. Now you need a battery plugged into your ESC for this to work. And you're going to want to shut, disconnect, or maybe even shut down Betaflight Configurator. All right, connect and read setup. Great. Let's see, this is firmware 16.7. And let's do flash all. And we're going to do 16.71. And 16.71 is the first official version of BL Heli S that supports bi-directional D-Shot, which is a feature that we definitely want. I'm just gonna hit flash. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change motor two to reversed and motor three to reversed to fix their direction and hit right setup. Now we should, now that we've put uh, BL Heli 16.71 on here, we should be able to go to the configuration tab and enable bi-directional D-shot. Uh, if you do that, make sure to change the motor poles. The default is 14 and you want it to be 12. These motors have 12 magnets, not 14. Let's try that with a save and reboot. Yeah, and what you want to see is 0% errors here. That indicates that bi-directional D-shot is working. What else do we need to do to get this guy set up? This is just basic beta flight stuff. Uh, arming angle. 180 degrees, soft serials turned on. I don't think we need that. I'm gonna turn on RX set and RX lost. These are the motor beacon. These will use the motors to beep because we don't have a beeper on this quad. I like to turn this on, especially with smaller quads. It helps you find the quad if you like crash in the grass and you can't find it. Save and reboot that. And let's go to the ports tab and, oh, this will be very simple to set up. There's only like two ports. Great. So we've got the receiver on UART1, and that's what's set up by default. So it's T2 for smart audio. Okay, and save and reboot. Now the receiver type that I'm using is SRXL2. Uh, you're gonna pick the one that you're using, whether, whether it's Crossfire, for a lot of you it's gonna be Crossfire. For some people it's gonna be FreeSky SBUS. Um, Few people will be using F port, probably not that many. I'm gonna pick SRXL2 and save and reboot. And if you are using SRXL2, you also need to go set serial RX half duplex equals on and save. Next, I'm gonna get my controller. I'm gonna power on my controller and we will have to plug in a battery to get the receiver to power back up. And if we go to the receiver tab, hopefully I will see movement on my sticks. Yes, yes I do. My sticks are moving. At this point, the next thing to do is to set up your channel mapping, your channel endpoints, and your aux modes. And this is something I covered in a great deal of detail in my beginner series. So I'm gonna link you to that down in the video description. If you don't know how to do it, it's, it's the same for pretty much every quad. So it's not anything that's specific to this. And uh, it's like one in the morning, so I kinda don't wanna go over it all again. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna set up my aux modes, my receiver endpoints, my channel mapping, and I'll see you back here. 
Now let's put the protune on it to make it fly as like good as it could possibly fly. We're going to go to the FPV Crate Tiny Trainer page and I actually had trouble finding it. They stuck it in between these two videos. Um, we're going to click on the link to that page, which again, I'll put down in the video description, of course. Uh, and we're going to just highlight this text, except it doesn't have copy. It doesn't have freaking carriage returns, does it? No. Okay. That's too bad. So let's just add some carriage returns. And I'll put this down in the video description too. Fortunately, it's not my first time. So some of this stuff actually I can see doesn't apply to this exact build that I've done. And I want to, I'm going to comment it out. Let me show you what I mean by that. Um, serial RX provider equals crossfire. Well, if I was using crossfire, that would be true. I'm going to, but I'm not. So I'm going to put a hash mark in front of that line, which will comment it out. Yeah. And here they're messing with the OSD, but I've got the OSD set how I like it. So I'm going to put a hash mark in front of that line and comment it out. Everything else can stay. Okay, let's copy. Let's go over to the CLI. And paste. And enter. And save. And the final thing I want to do is go to the PID tuning tab and set up my rates. And what we've got here are my typical freestyle rates, but for a race rig, I like to use a lot lower rates, closer to like 400 degrees per second. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the RC rate to one. And let's lower the rate down until we get to about 400. Yeah. 0.50. Great. You'll also need to unlock the video transmitter. It's the same for all Unify Pro 32 devices. I've got a separate video on how to unlock it if you don't know how to do that. If you only have ever unlocked the earlier, the non-Pro32 ones, it's actually different than it used to be. The, the uh, blink sequence is different. So you may want to go check that video out if this is your first Pro32. And then the uh, cover. Hmm. Okay, so it doesn't go totally flush in every way. And then the kit comes with four zip ties to go around the ends of the arms and hold them down. Well, that is going to do it for this build. The only thing left to do is to take it out and fly it. I'm actually going to take this out to the multi-GP qualifier that's this weekend in Knoxville. And when everybody else is flying five inches, I'm going to fly this guy and see how I can do with the multi-GP. Hey, it's supposed to be a racing rig, right? And uh, yeah, so we're going to see. So get subscribed if you want to make sure you don't miss that whenever it goes live. Get subscribed and hit the notification bell so people are, people are like, oh, you know, when did you release that video? Well, you, you missed it because you're not subscribed. Um, but that's going to do it for now. There is a link. Thank you so much, uh, FPV Crate, for sending me this kit. I've been wanting to try one of these out for a while, but I just never got around to it. And so they were finally just like, here, build it. And if you want to build it, there's a link in the video description. You can get all this stuff in one box, ready to go, build it up just like I showed you, and then take it out and fly it. Thank you so much for watching. Happy flying. What are you still doing here? The video's over. Do you watch all the videos all the way to the end? Wow. You are a super fan. Thank you. That actually helps the channel a lot when you watch the videos all the way to the end. YouTube loves that. You know what else YouTube loves? When you subscribe. Or when you join my Patreon for as little as $2 a month or more if you feel like I've earned... Actually, YouTube doesn't like you to join my Patreon. They don't get a cut of that.